Now that's beautiful, isn't it? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Plymouth University. Welcome to this evening's COG Talk, which is on the topic of empathy and compassion in medicine. The National Health Service has been in the news recently for a number of reasons, not all of them good, but the issue of compassion and empathy in the caring of patients has been one of the things which has been very much at the forefront of some rather negative reports about certain institutions. Do come in, do come in, make yourself comfortable. We're only just starting and it's lovely to see you. So come in, come in, come in, don't be shy. It's lovely to see you. Come in. Okay, so compassion is something which is important. We've got two very eminent speakers who are going to talk on this subject. We've got Dr. Rupert Jones, who's a research, senior research fellow at Plymouth University, and also a GP, and very much practiced in the issue of compassion and empathy in his general practice. And we've got Professor Paul Dieppe, who's Professor of Medicine at Exeter University, and is a specialist in research on this particular topic, as well as having a vast range of practical experience himself in the clinical field. So, I'm pleased to ask, first of all, Dr. Rupert Jones, I'm going to ask Rupert, to provide us with his experience of compassion and empathy from the perspective of the doctor, from the perspective of the patient, and how it works in the National Health Service. Rupert. Good evening, everybody. Sorry, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Rupert Jones, I'm a GP, and I, my practice is just across the road here. Uh, I've been a GP for some 30 years um, and a part-time academic. So um, hopefully I can shed some light on this topic, really from my personal perspective. Um, and I welcome questions and interruptions as I go along, if there's something I say which you don't agree with. Okay. Um, so, we start with Wikipedia, like all things in life, um, and that tells us what is the diagnosis of healthcare, uh, which I thought was rather disappointing. It says, the diagnosis, treatment, prevention of disease, illness, injury, and other physical and mental impairments in humans. Well, I thought we could add to that. Um, I think it's, a, personally, I think it's about understanding the condition which a person has, and it's understanding the impact it has on them, and as uh, and the impact on those around them. And I think it's about providing something for them, which is about medical, um, social, um, or emotional help. And I think it's also about providing information about the condition. And some of the work Michael and myself have been doing has been about information for patients, what they need. Um, it's important to give patients a perspective about their condition. Where's it come from? And what are we going to do about it in future? How can we prevent it getting worse? And that's one of the things we're really bad at in general practice. So when I was a medical student, I went to a lecture um, about being a, a doctor. And they showed this picture painted in the late uh, 18th century of this kind, caring doctor. And they said about him, well, he sits there and he looks kind and caring, but that's all he could do because he didn't have any treatment. And I don't know what you think about that. What do you think about that? <coughs> Lucky him. <laughs> Lucky him. Well, I personally, over time, I felt that actually he was probably doing quite a good job. He was um, concerned about the patient, you can see that. Um, he was making an assessment. He was using his experience and his wisdom to come to some kind of conclusion about this uh, situation. Here we've got an incredibly sickly child and very concerned parents. Um, so he's going to tell the parents what to expect and what to do. It may be the child's going to die, maybe the child's going to live. It may be somewhere in between and he can offer some advice on that and he can offer some treatment. And in fact there is treatment here. There it is. It's probably a placebo. We'll discuss whether that's a good thing or a bad thing later. There's probably some fluids, which probably is useful, and maybe that is for tepid sponging. So maybe he's actually doing a bit more treatment than he was given credit for when I was a medical student. 
And actually, when I'm with a patient who um, we, is beyond the realms of medical care in terms that we can't treat their condition and in palliative care, I'm exactly in that position, and this happens day in, day out. I don't have any special drugs to help them. We have to help them through their condition. So I started as a medical student, and I had really bad examples of care at my teaching hospital. And just to give you some clue about this, I was on a ward round with eight medical students, and I was presented at the end of the bed with a, um, a consultant who's talking about a patient, and the patient had rectal cancer. And I was told that, firstly, the patient didn't know the diagnosis, and they were about to have an operation the next day. Secondly, that all us eight medical students were expected to do an examination on this man who didn't know that he had cancer. And I found that was an incredibly important teaching lesson to me. That is how you don't care for people. Um, and so I learned a lot in medical school. Um, and I think one thinks about the standards in those days, and we may have kind of a feeling that everything was fantastic then. And, um, but actually patient standards, were, um, standards of care were quite variable. But what was clear was that patients felt their doctors were caring for them very well. And they were doing their best, whether they were or not. In fact, nursing standards were very high now. Patients never questioned doctors very much. The consultants behaved like gods. Um, and actually it was quite common, particularly with serious disease, to lie. We wouldn't tell them they had cancer or something serious. We'd just tell the family, but we didn't tell the patient. And I found that very, very difficult. Um, and treatment was based on whatever that godlike consultant felt was right. And so it was arbitrary. And there were a lot of mistakes in those systems. But they seldom saw the light of day, so mistakes were not acted on. And I'm just going to give you an example of a letter which comes from about that time from a dermatologist. The patient has a patch of alopecia areata of the occipital and also the vertex of the scalp. I can find no nervous cause for this. When I read this a few years ago, I thought, this is typical. We don't know how to treat the condition, so we blame the patient for it by saying it must have a nervous cause. Um, and then we treat it with a tincture of iodine with, say, a cotton wool and a matchstick. Well, that isn't going to do much good. But actually, maybe it is going to do some good, because iodine's brown, and if they had brown hair, it might just disguise the patch. And then followed the prescription for um, the other condition noted here, falling of hair. Now, falling of hair is either going to be age-related and it's not going to get better, or it may be some stress-related condition where it will probably get better within a few months. And I thought this was a fabulous prescription, because God knows what it means, but if that was on your piece of paper, you would feel that there is something mumbo-jumbo-ish going on here, because you couldn't possibly understand it, and therefore it must be powerful medicine. And the final line I love particularly, which is, the paint will need applying for some months. It's a bit like the old Mountie Bank doctors who used to say, the love potion will work tomorrow, and he left town that night. <laughs> so, basically, um, the science is moving in and medicine is changing. My alma mater now looks like it is on the right. And that is an indication of the amount of science there is in medicine. That small hospital used to care for the same population, and look what we've got now. The balance of power in the relations between doctors and patients has changed with the more information which doctors, uh, patients have, and training of doctors to be more patient-focused, and I'm sure we've all seen that and appreciated that. And we have more science in the medicine as we practice it. There was a paper called Clinical Freedom is a Dead Duck, published in the 1980s in the BMJ. And this shook the profession, because as doctors, we knew how to treat patients. That was our job as a professional, and nobody could question us on that. And yet, suddenly, we have scientific evidence with guidelines and so on, and our judgment goes. Actually, what we need is evidence-based treatments. And so these have come in, and we have stacks and stacks of guidelines. And we've also seen um, placebos shown the back door. I used to be able to prescribe a tonic for the old ladies who used to come in and say, oh, doc, I've got all these different problems. And I go, what would you like for it? And say, oh, a nice tonic. And there used to be something called metatone. Sadly, it's disappeared from the British National Formulary. 
Okay, so evidence-based medicine is the gold standard, the god we now bow down to, but actually it's not all perfect. It's based on a randomized <coughs> controlled trial by which you take groups of people, you allocate them randomly to different treatments, and you compare outcomes. But it's not all that it might be. It's not all so objective as you think it might be. For instance, when we looked at people with chronic lung disease, which is my area of interest, we find that around 1% of our patients with chronic lung disease would be suitable for inclusion in these trials. In other words, you select people for the trials because they are going to turn up to appointments, they're going to comply with their appointments, they're going to comply with their medications, they're going to turn up and have all these tests done. And most of my patients who I see in routine practice wouldn't do that. And so they actually inform me very little about how to treat my patients, but they're very good at telling me how to treat a group of 100 people with a condition. Certainly in general practice that doesn't happen very often. Um, and there is this thing called publication bias. The industry-funded trials are four times more likely to give a positive result than independent studies. Uh, does that come as a surprise to you? No. We accept that. But actually, these are meant to be objective scientific studies. And I think they can be really quite misleading. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things which matter in uh, medicine, um, such as the talking therapies, where you cannot have an adequate placebo for those. And so those sort of get sidelined or ignored. What about patients' perspective? We've done a lot of work within the NHS about patients' perspective of what they want, and we've done patient surveys, and I'll come back to that. Patients want to have access to um, health care at the time when they need it. They need to have someone they feel familiar with, we're told. They want continuity of care. And I think it's probably more and more difficult to get continuity of care. Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, is access difficult? Mm. It can be. Getting to see someone when you want to. Um, and the new systems to improve access have often failed, in my view. Patients want to be, uh, t they want to talk and they want to be heard and they want to have some agreement about what goes forward and some kind of rationalization and respect for their problems. We did a lot of work around COPD, which is chronic lung disease, when we were designing services on a national basis. Um, and we got large amounts of groups of patients to tell us what did they want from the health service. And what they said they wanted was very clear. They wanted someone very local to them, maybe in their practice, who was an expert on the disease. And they want to be able to access them any time, day or night, 24 hours a day, and they wanted to speak to that person each time. <laughs> so sometimes it's not always possible to provide what people would like. Okay, I think also some of the work we've done with Michael um, told us um, about what patients want. This, patient, this quote comes from a patient dying of lung disease who couldn't breathe. And that's a terrible thing to have to deal with. You know you're going to get more breathless and you know you're going to die of it. But their clear point was, tell me the truth about what's happening and I can manage it. Other patients do not want to know about uh, things, they just want to be told what's going on and they want us to tell them what's going on. They don't want us to inquire about their feelings and emotions and so on. And what do they want us to do for them? They just, you're the doctor, tell me what to do. <coughs> and one of the things which I found particularly impressive was um, a very simple comment, but it's absolutely true. And we forget this in medicine time and time again. Patients want someone to be kind to them, particularly people with long-term conditions. Okay, and so looking at it from a general practice perspective about care and compassion, people come into medicine to do that. And actually, when you've trained and you've learned how to do all this, you find the reality of practicing medicine produces barriers um, to providing good care, compassionate care. For a start, you've got to deal with patients, and that's a problem because firstly, they may not take the medicines you give them, and secondly, even if they do everything you ask them, they may not get better. And that's extremely uh, difficult for a doctor. Doctors also want to be loved. They want thanks and they want respect. And in fact, many of them miss that when they retire. And not half the person they were when they were providing for other people. Doctors need confidence. Confidence to deal with medicine. When I'm in practice, 
I can't doubt everything I see because if I was to question every person I saw and think, oh, maybe this person's got cancer, I could never actually practice. And so we get the situation where you need to be confident, but equally you've got to be sensitive to what people are suggesting to you. So we have this conundrum about complaints. If we don't get told about the mistakes we make or where things don't go right, we're never going to learn and we're never going to improve. And that was a problem in the past. However, if you get complaints as doctors, very often it's really damaging to the doctor. And we've seen lots of doctors completely leave the profession simply because one or two complaints. So there's a conundrum here. And some of the complaints which have destroyed doctors, and it does destroy them, have been for completely spurious reasons. Equally, we're not being told of the other problems so that we don't change. And I think there's something we've got to do about this. I think a lot of it might come in the training of doctors to be aware that they're going to get complaints and not to deal with it so personally and so emotionally involved when they get a complaint. So that this doesn't erode the compassion they can give to the next patient. So to try and improve things, we get taught how to do doctor-patient consultation skills. Um, I won't go through that list, but that's all we've got to try and do in our 10-minute consultations. I say 10-minute consultations. In our practice, we have we'll come at 15 um, minutes because we're so slow, but I find that helps. But it's very difficult to do all of those things in one consultation. And we are taught this is how a consultation should go. A patient should tell their story, and on the right-hand side, the, patient, the doctor should listen. Well, that would be nice. Um, the patient should reflect on their feelings and doctor responds and so on. And this is how medical students are taught. I have, I have significant problems about teaching consultation skills because I think that for some people this works, but most people revert, re, revert to their normal patient, their personal characteristics after a, a period of time getting better at it. Um, but you may have different views about that. If we um, look at a consultation in reality, the patient should do an opening narrative and not be interrupted, but on average, a, GP, a doctor will take 12 seconds before interrupting them. And, which is, is that a fair comment? Yes, you agree with that. Okay. Um, and the interruptions are often um, about getting the patient from the doctor's point of view back on track so they can find out what's going on and get the consultation over with and done with as soon as possible. Um, and it's interesting in this particular paper they said that women were more uh, interrupted than men and that was probably a sign that men were trying to interrupt them because that's about power, the doctor having the power in the relationship. Um, whereas in fact actually women were talking more than the men. Um, so it may not be the case. And not all interruptions are bad. Um, some of the interruptions are actually elucidating the problem and get helping the patient to say what's going on. So, we have the system of response <coughs> now to try to improve the quality of care. What we've got is big variation in quality of care. So it became this thing that we need to make sure that doctors are rewarded for doing good care. And this is a good intention. I'm sure you would approve of this intention, yes? Yeah? And the road to hell is paved with good intentions because what you then do is you try and feel you can measure quality of care. So you measure it, you reward it, and the people who are very good at ticking boxes get very well rewarded, and it's not necessarily about good care. And you see this in education and other areas. And you get these spurious targets. So to improve the quality of care, you have targets to get people out of A and E or to get them treated with this and that. And so you see in South uh, Safford's where the disaster occurred in the hospital and thousands of deaths uh, came from it, was that it was the targets which were blamed for poor care. The targets which were introduced to improve care detracted from care. Um, and I personally have a problem with that, but I think there's some truth in it. But any doctor or any nurse who goes past a patient who hasn't got water or hasn't got food and can ignore that and say that's a manager's fault, I've got a problem with that. You've got to have responsible for your own actions and care. Okay, and so we get paid for items of service and smears, and what that means is that doctors who are paid for doing these things pressurize patients to have interventions which they don't want. And I think that is a big problem. Um, and 
the way we're paid now is a third of all doctors, GPs' income comes from ticking boxes. And that creates huge problems because the whole of the organization then starts revolving around ticking boxes instead of actually providing what really matters is dealing with the problems of patients coming in. When a patient walks into my door, and I open the computer screen, I immediately get flashing up things. This patient needs a blood pressure check. This patient needs a weight check. This needs this, needs that. And it actually interrupts me in dealing with the patient who's come through the door. And so we have quite a lot of external pressures. Um, and we're being judged by all sorts of things. We have so many surveys. We had one situation where we had 10% of our population being surveyed with a postal survey. They were also being surveyed in the practice. And we had someone from Exeter University who was doing a survey on the surveys. <laughs> it's quite ridiculous the amount of surveys going on. We judged on complaints about our prescribing, how we manage our diseases, all sorts of things. And we have these um, enormous financial imperatives and all the time, the targets are changing, and it's very difficult for us to keep up with that. And so what happens is, you're getting stressed, so it becomes very difficult to deliver the care you want to on a one-to-one patient-doctor uh, basis. Um, so, the unwanted outcomes of all of this is that we get these patient-centered care, we get improved Empathy, which can be very helpful, but we have a generation of doctors who are taught to be nice to patients, good, but are not taught to stand up to patients. And that means quite a lot of problems, so that people are being signed off for long periods of time, which means they end up on the scrap heap and on benefits, when actually they'll be better off at work if they get a firm line with them sometimes. They get addictions to a prescription medication, which is happening all the time, simply because doctors find it very difficult to say no to diazepam and other addictive treatments, which is still being given out in vast quantities. And we also get the problem that we started to medicalize uh, problems like sadness. People come in because of a normal event in their life and they end up on antidepressants. And I think that's a huge problem. Um, and I think our training of doctors needs to reevaluate this business about the balance in the, re in the relationship so that we can actually provide better care. Um, and I won't go on about measuring care because I think that's what I've already mentioned. So in summary, I think doctors go into the profession because they want to provide good care and they want to be respected. I think the empathy is at the heart of the medicine and should be so, but I think the challenges of actually delivering that in, rea in real life has always been and is actually perhaps getting more and more difficult and there are many balances to be struck. So there's a few questions I've put up there for you, if you can't think of any for yourself. Um, but uh, basically, these are some of the things which I think um, are of concern. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Rupert. Was that a bit of an eye opener? <laughs> you were surprised by that. I think that was a most interesting and frank account of what happens in general practice. And I think that's really, I've, I've never heard such an insightful account from a, a doctor on that particular practice. So thank you very much indeed, Rupert. That, that's absolutely excellent. Um, I'm now going to ask Paul to talk about the science of caring. Does it actually matter? Rupert has pointed out how difficult it is to care in general practice because of all the constraints that are faced, which the doctor faces. And Paul is, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, going to tell us why it matters. Is it just a matter of making patients happy? Or are there genuine medical consequences for happy patients? Thank you very much, Michael. A, a pleasure to be here. Um, my background is uh, I was a clinical rheumatologist for a lot of my life then moved uh, sideways a bit into health services research which is about systems of delivery and more recently been working on health and well-being and I'm currently doing a part-time PhD on my major interest which is healing. Now uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly so that we give you a chance to talk but I'm going to just uh, very quickly touch on 
on five issues. First, the difference between acute and chronic care, then a bit about placebo, which Rupert's mentioned, uh, the nurturing response, the biophilia hypothesis, and how all that works together. So the first point I want to make is that acute and chronic care are very different issues, but they're muddled up by medicine and medical science. So if uh, during this uh, presentation I do get my first heart attack, I actually don't want you being nice to me or being compassionate or caring. I want you to get me to the hospital very quickly, and I want the treatment that is prescribed by evidence-based medicine and the trials that have been done. But when six months later, I'm not feeling very well, I've got various aches and pains and I'm struggling with my work, evidence-based medicine and drugs and the rest of it is going to be absolutely useless to me uh, because it can provide nothing. And what medicine has done is forget and muddle up those two issues. So we use the same approach to the acute crisis and the sudden disease. Uh, we've applied that model, which works very well for the heart attack. We've applied the model uh, to chronic disease, which is on the uptake, and of course it doesn't work. Uh, and this lack of understanding of that dichotomy is the first point I want to make. And managing chronic disease is about caring, it's not about curing. Now, the second point I want to make is to pick up on Rupert's point about placebo. And uh, placebo has been described by Michael Brooks in his excellent little book, 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. Uh, he says, uh, the placebo effect uh, could and probably should change the face of medicine, and I agree with him. Uh, placebo is amazing. Uh, placebo treatment, for example, can cure cows of mastitis and prevent rabbits from getting atherosclerosis. So this isn't just about uh, people imagining things or human expectations. It works extremely well uh, for animals, as long as you care for the animals. And if you want to pick me up on these experiments, which I'm quoting here in discussion, please do. I haven't got time to quote the evidence to you. Uh, we do need to distinguish placebo effects from placebo responses, or what I now call the healing response. So if we do a, a standard trial, which we love doing in medicine, we, we, get, we do an intervention, we get this much change, we have some sort of control, often placebo, we get this much change. What we don't usually do is look at no treatment controls. What would happen if you don't do anything? And to really figure out placebo response, you need to adjust for no treatment. And then you can see what the real effect of placebo is, and it's huge. And of course, medicine only actually worries about this little bit. It only worries about the little bit that's the difference between the placebo and the intervention. So we're always fiddling to make the chemical slightly better to make this slightly higher. We forget completely about this bit, and we don't worry about it. How stupid is that? Uh, and placebo does actually account for about 70% of the effect of our commonly used interventions for things like pain, anxiety, and depression. But of course, placebo's by definition got nothing in it. So it can't be the placebo that's having the effect. This amazing effect, responsible for most of the effect of many of our common interventions, can't actually be the placebo because the placebo has nothing. And of course, what it is about is about the caring. It's about uh, the empathy, the love, the concern, and the simple contact with another human being. That's what has the effect. And interestingly, recent trials on the placebo suggest that some people can deliver that effect much more, uh, much better than others. So some of us are good at that, and some of us are not which I think resonates with one of the points that Rupert was making about can you really teach these things or have some people got it and others not got it? I don't know. I think that's an interesting area that we need to pursue. Now, how do we explain that? Are there any biological mechanisms that could help us to explain these amazing phenomena? Well, I think there are. I want to touch briefly on two of them. The first is the so-called nurturing response. Now, Here's a picture which you recognize. I just want you to uh, pause a minute and uh, think about how you feel when you look at that picture. Does anybody want to, to hazard how they feel when they look at that? Nice. <laughs> oh, I nice. smile. Yeah. Smile. Yeah. Good. Relax. Happy. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, if This is a very interesting phenomenon because uh, human beings, of course, we have these infants which are completely useless for the first few years of their life. I mean, in the case of my own kids, completely useless until they're in their 30s, but <laughs> you know, that may be a bit unusual. Um, and we have to look after them, we have to do everything for them, we have to nurture them, we have to love them, otherwise our species would not survive. So we have actually evolved a nurturing response, which is a very powerful, deeply rooted physiological response. Uh, we've all heard about the automatic fight and flight response to threat. Well, we're actually hardwired for exactly the opposite of that. So the, ex the, the opposite of fight and flight is getting together, nurturing each other, feeling good, relaxing, uh, and uh, uh, getting a, a huge physiological responses when this is switched on. And one of the ways of switching it on is when uh, any of us look at a small baby smile. That switches it on and you get these enormous physiological changes. Uh, and I think that part of the ability of some doctors to get good responses from caring is because they have the ability to switch on the nurturing response. Uh, it involves, a f you have to feel safe uh, to be able to do it. So that's one hardwired mechanism we have to kind of understand why caring matters. Uh, we're programmed re to respond positively to each other. And, we, and it, again, in evolutionary terms, we had to act as groups, the collaborative groups, in order to uh, succeed. Now, the second mechanism is, uh, surrounds the so-called biophilia hypothesis, uh, which says that we're also hardwired through evolution to respond positively to our natural environment. Uh, and there's a huge amount of work going on about this in the uh, European Centre for Environment and Human Health down in Truro, where they're looking at the positive health effects of green space and blue space, the positive affect and uh, the restorativeness that you get from being a part of nature. And again, we would appear to have hardwired biological mechanisms uh, which explain why this is important to us. And it's backed up by science. Being in a nice environment helps you uh, recover. So if we try to bring these strands together, I'm happy to discuss in more detail any of these ideas. Uh, sick animals respond positively to warm, uh, empathic, caring interactions, whether they're human animals or other animals. And we know from work of many people, I've just uh, quoted Stuart Mercer's work here, uh, because he's a mate of mine, uh, but we know that those interactions hasten recovery from illness. And similarly, sick people uh, recover from illness better and surgery better for their nice surroundings. And classical studies done many years ago by Roger Ulrich in the States that have been repeated many times that show just having a nice view from your hospital window will make a huge difference to your recovery. So these kind of things actually have taken us some way towards understanding and being able to explore uh, why caring matters in healthcare, uh, and particularly in the context of, of chronic disease. We are complex mechanisms. We cannot be reduced to simple clinical trials and the giving of drugs. We depend on interactions with our environment, with other people, and on caring. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. I think that's given us a very good insight into the positive effects of caring on our bodies and why caring seems to be such an important thing. Now, we're now coming to the interesting part of the evening when we're going to take questions from the audience. If I could ask our two speakers to come up to the front. And um, if you've got a... I know it's always difficult to get the first question. Right. Once we get the first question, we we are rolling. So if you, we've got a microphone. Uh, we've got one here. Can I, can Excellent. I first, then it's oh, thank you. You're absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Can I? Ask? Yes. We're just giving you a microphone. I've got a loud voice. If I'm all right. You're, you're talking that the brain is hardwired to be empathic. In which case, why don't you use uh, MRI? to recognise which part of the brain is reacting to these external stimuli. Mm? Uh, that would actually localise, because um, as, as an engineer, things must have a cause. If the brain is hardwired, that must happen somewhere within the brain, unless you're going to waft, unless it 
what, what one laughs away about um, uh, about nothing concrete. Uh, ask Paul to answer this one. The the hard wiring is uh, known where it is. It's through the uh, autonomic nervous system, originating in the brainstem with links to the uh, hypothalamic area. So we pretty much know quite a bit about the wiring. We could, of course, do fMRI studies, and there have been a lot of fMRI studies, functional MR studies done with placebo, and sure enough, various uh, funny bits of the brain light up. I have to tell you, I don't think that explains anything. If something changes in the way you feel or the way you think, uh, clearly parts of the brain are going to be responsible for that. But given all the plasticity within the cortex, which means that different parts can take over different functions, I'm not sure that helps explain it. And we do actually know quite a lot about the hard wiring. It's through, it's through the vagal nerve, most principally. Uh, I will just take the opportunity to add one other thing that I think is really interesting about this, though, that the system is also linked to facial expression. So when you switch on the nurturing response, everything changes. Your eyes light up, your facial expressions change, the tone of voice that you use changes, you become more musical. So it's all linked up through these quite primitive centers of the brain, and I think it explains quite a lot about the importance of human interactions. If you're, if you're feeling unsafe, then your facial expression shuts down. Your tone of voice gets quite different. I'm not going to try and pretend to do it because it will all go wrong. But, uh, you know, we, we actually have biological explanations for a lot of these variations in human interaction. But it's, but it's at lower brain levels, so cortical brain imaging isn't going to help us very much, I think. Another question, please. Yes, we have one here. It seems to me that you're both describing caring as being more a knack than a, a set of technical practices that can be monitored and evaluated, and in, in, in that sense, perhaps difficult to train. So I was wondering, how, as there's a greater and greater need for caring in an aging population, how are we going to develop a greater number of highly able carers? Okay, I'm going to ask both our speakers to respond to that. So first of all, Rupert. Um, I think you're right that we do need to teach um, about caring and how you achieve that. Um, and I think one of the things you need to do is reward respect. And one of the ways you can do that is getting people to give feedback to the people they've been um, working with. So that might be the patients giving feedback or in the environment where they're working. So if training with nurses or doctors, they need to have feedback on the kind of things we're talking about. And I think these are empathic things like respect and like the way patients feel when they treat them in that way. And I think that's been one of the things which has been sadly missing in many of the institutions where things have gone wrong. That culture doesn't measure the respect of the individual. And, that's, and every one of those institutions will have a plaque on the wall somewhere saying our mission statement is to respect people, but the culture doesn't. So I think it is about generating the right culture in an organisation. When it comes to training individuals, there's a huge science around this, um, but my personal belief is that the training is useful, um, but many people relapse into their own way of uh, functioning when they're left to it day in, day out. And that will be changed by the culture of their organization and what is rewarded and what's not. So if you're rewarded by getting people out of that uh, consultation in five minutes, then you know, that's, that's what people will do. Uh, I haven't got very much to add. I think it's a great question. I think we don't actually know whether we can teach people the knack. I think some people have the knack and some don't. Whether we can teach those who don't the knack, I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably like everything else in this world. It's not dichotomous. We have, you know, it's a, it's a normal distribution. Some are crap at it, if I could use that term, and some are very good. But whether we can bring people up a bit, I don't know. I think one of the problems is we don't quite know enough about the elements of the trick in terms of what to train people. So I think that's a very important future agenda. Sorry, Paul was thinking, um, there are horses for courses. Um, and, you know, who's good at one thing isn't necessarily good at another. In my old practice where I trained, um, there were two doctors and a patient said to me, I see Norman for my body and I see Graham for my mind. <laughs> They're both good at their own thing. Thank you. Uh, another question over here. Okay. 
Um, I had a question uh, to Paul from something that came up from Rupert's presentation. Um, you talked about nurturing, and one of the things Rupert's presentation said was wisdom. And you didn't, because I'm, I'm, not talking, I'm not referring to experience, I'm referring to wisdom itself, and, and how it integrates, interlocks with, with the idea of emotion, nurturing. I'm just wondering what your thought is. Yeah, w wisdom's interesting, isn't it? I mean, human species are peculiar for all sorts of reasons, but one of the most peculiar ones is about us, is that we live twice as long as we need to. And we've actually had to put in this strange phenomenon called the menopause uh, to make sure that reproduction doesn't go wrong in this second era of life we have, which is just as long as the one where we can reproduce in a healthy way. Why have we done that? Well, one of the hypotheses is that because the accumulated wisdom and memory of the older people is of such value to the tribe, uh, I, being very old, I rather like that hypothesis <laughs> and feel very wise telling you about it. Uh, and of course, in old societies, the older people, the wise elders, did have a hugely important role in the nurturing of the younger ones. So I think you're right to make the link. Whether it's actually kind of wired into us, I don't know. But we have evolved this longevity, which must confer some advantage. So I think you're right to raise it. I think there's something else about wisdom. Um, and that is about wisdom is about power. The people who had the knowledge had the power. Um, and that's one of the things I uh, alluded to. Uh, now that information is available, the power is gone. I, I can't resist adding to Paul's point about longevity, that um, Homo sapiens uh, is the species which developed this peculiarity. The Neanderthals, who are very closely related to us, did not. They would die out at the age of about 45. But if you look at very early Homo sapiens, sapiens going back you know, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, you will find specimens of about 70 or 80 years. So we have this very strange evolutionary development which seems to be peculiar to us humans. Another question, I think. We've got one. And I, I just wondered um, if you could reflect for us a little bit more on the extent to which the kind of organisational culture might encourage or discourage particularly people in the caring professions from you know, developing empathic and caring skills. And I'm, I'm interested in myself because I'm involved in clinical psychology training, so we particularly wish to foster skills in empathy and caring. So I'll um, ask um, Rupert to answer that first. And then we'll... well, to a certain extent, I've kind of tried to answer that already. I, I do think um, we need to have training in these things, and I think one of the things which is very helpful, um, certainly was for myself and I think for many people, is to be videoed in consultation. And you're amazed by how you do strange things which you never thought you did. Um, or your body position is not what you think it is. So I think those sorts of things can be very useful. Um, and I, I think I've already alluded to the way in which the culture of an organisation is absolutely critical. I mean, we go into care homes a lot, um, and some of them are absolutely terrible, and you can almost instinctively tell that when you walk through the door. And it's not about the smell of urine, because that is a huge clue, but it's much, much more than that. And it's not about the, the race of the carers, because we've got one um, place where we've almost entirely Filipino um, people working, and they are fantastic carers. Um, so it, um, it's, it's difficult to, to answer that, but the culture is something we need to look at very carefully in these organisations. I mean, I suppose I, I think that the um, current culture of payment by results kind of creates a kind of factory environment in terms of throughput of patients and measuring products. And that, that culture, to me, goes against the idea of developing reflective practice, practice-based evidence, and the, the kind of things one might want to do in, in training any, anyone in a kind of caring profession. So I think that, you know, that we're working in environments that actually constrain what we can do in terms of encouraging and enhancing the kind of skills that our patients seem to, to want. i just comment a little further on that. I think that's a hugely important point. And I think it's particularly true amongst nurses working in hospitals 
where the throughput of patients through those wards and through those beds is so fast, all about this god of productivity and the ability to provide good care in that situation is completely eroded. And as a result, we've seen huge problems in nurses being able to do what they want to do. Um, and now nurses are being blamed for bad standards, and I don't blame the nurses, frankly. Uh, two very quick points to add, if I may. The first is I think this is a part of a much wider societal issue of the way we've become embedded in a consumerist uh, financially driven type of social functioning. So I think there's a, a wider context than just the healthcare context that's driving it. That's one point I'd make. The second point I'd make is that I think that, uh, particularly for doctors at any rate, the people we get into medical schools and the way we train them is all about science and it's all about passing exams which are about knowledge. It's very, very difficult to examine people effectively about whether they're any good at empathy and caring, so we don't do it. Uh, and, you know, they're intelligent people, they're good at jumping through hoops, and they, so we enculturate them into it's all about knowledge and big boys toys and clever diagnostics, and, you know, you, you, you try and talk to them about caring, and they say, oh, for goodness sake, let's go away and learn more about the genome. Um, and that, that, of course, will make sure they pass the exam, so two, two, two separate points. We've got questions coming out tremendously now. Okay, we've got one at the back, then we'll move here, and then we'll come down to this side over here. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Paul, I cannot uh, pass up this opportunity. As uh, 40 years ago, you and I started at the same medical school. And we're both in the same position now. We're, we've had different, but... Uh, I went to the Falklands, you were in Kuwait when uh, Saddam Hussein invaded. Um, dangerous times, and I depended very much, and I bet you did, on the influences that we had at medical school. This business of teaching caring is not, today we're going to teach caring. It's going on the ward in that old-fashioned way with, uh, in my case, Gordon Hamilton Fairley, who was, who was so tragically assassinated by the IRA. He exuded love and affection for his patients, this, uh, whether the patient was a duchess or a docker. And I've always, <laughs> in dealing with a fighter, a, a fighter pilot who's been shot down while he was attacking my hospital, what would Gordon have done? He would have laughed. You show the guy the love and affection that he deserves as a, as a warrior who's done his best for his country. And it's remarkable how, you know, the positive response that comes. So, I think you've, this is absolutely critical, what you've, what, what you, the subject that you're, you're dealing with. Um, it was never taught formally, it was passive. But I'm sure you, like, and I cannot understand how there was a culture of such indifference to suffering um, in, in Stafford. I, as we say in the Navy, I just can't fit that in to a, any kind of attitude for life. Thank you for what you both have said. Rick, it's just fantastic to see you again after all this time and really quite weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've both changed. Um, you're absolutely right. And I, I was saying there's a problem with training of medical students now, but of course we, the other point about that that I didn't mention and, and Rupert might want to comment on this too, is that a lot of this is dependent on what people call the informal curriculum, as you point out, and not the formal curriculum. It's about role models. And I guess one of my worries about what's happening now is that role models, senior role models in nursing and in medicine are caught up with the science and the technology much more than our mentors were. Um, mine was Wickham Balm rather than Hamilton Fairley, but it's the same story. And I worry that the mentors are not like ours, but who knows? Thanks. I think it's an important point. I think we all learn from a good teacher, an individual who inspires us, and we will meet those in whatever profession we're in. And those are the people hopefully will continue to be through the profession. I think they are there. Um, um, and I hope that evidence-based medicine will not erode that human thing, that human quality which inspires us. 
we have one question from over here, and then we'll come down to this side. Um, Rupert, um, I'm, I'm now retired as a GP. Uh, I, I would take issue with you as a comment um, when you said that um, uh, doctors are worse at dealing with uh, drug addicts and um, uh, sick certificates. So my experience over 40 years is that things haven't changed much really, depending on political um, influence. But what dramatically changed over the last five, ten years is that the GP is no longer the patient advocate. And given that I was listening to Radio 4 the other day, uh, and there was a big spiel about this computer program uh, that uh, defeated the chess champion and is now being trained to uh, take on evidence-based medicine. I would applaud that if it meant that the computer could deal with all the evidence-based rubbish and basically let doctors get and nurses and all the caring professions get on with the empathy and the caring. Do you agree? Um, in a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are several issues there. Oh, my comment about younger doctors not being able to challenge patients comes from quite a lot of experience because the patients have been, uh, sorry, the, the younger doctors have been taught to have this very caring thing and not how to challenge a, a patient when it's not in their best interest. So as a result, we're seeing people being prescribed drugs which I don't think they should be prescribed, uh, which are out of license use. And actually those doctors don't want to prescribe, but they find it difficult not to. And that is a real problem, I think, and I don't think we are addressing that. And I'm glad you haven't seen so much of that, but I've seen that. In our area, we have a lot of um, unemployment, we have a lot of people who are now going through ESA assessments to see whether they're fit for work, and they're all being told they should be going back to work. It's creating havoc. But it's equally true that many of those people should never have been off work so long, and they've gone on to a scrap heap, which they were placed there with connivance with their doctors. And I think that's something we really need to examine in ourselves. So, yes, I think from that point of view, it's interesting, and I'll, stick, I'll stand by my guns. In terms of computers, uh, I think what we've previously talked about is the doctor at one end of the consultation, the patient at the other end of the consultation. What we have is the third component of the consultation, which is the computer. The doctor is actually looking at the computer, not the patient. Sometimes the patients are looking at the computer and not the, pa uh, not the doctor. Um, the doctor is getting messages from the computer all the time. And they're now computer systems, um, and I worked with one which has 45,000 branching questions, which is a highly intelligent system. So you go to see the computer first, and you say, I've got a cough. And it then says, do you cough up flame? How long have you had it for? Have you got chest pains? In the end, it comes up with a diagnosis of TB and depression. Um, and it's very clever. Um, and I did a presentation in Europe, um, which went down, I have to say, like a lead balloon, um, in which I suggested that patients should see the computer first, get rid of all this evidence-based nonsense out of the way first, and then see the doctor afterwards. Um, but the European doctors all thought that we were trying to replace them with computers, which wasn't the idea at all. So I think there is a, a place. I think also computers shouldn't be written off when it comes to empathy. If you have a difficult problem, like you want to talk about your sexuality or something like that, who would you rather talk to? A nice caring doctor who's fiddling with his pencil or the computer? And the answer is, from scientific evidence, no doubt you're going to be more comfortable talking to the computer about it than the doctor. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Rupert. And uh, we've got some questions over this side. So one here, one here, and then we'll go back. Okay. Um, my question was about, because you pointed out about the problems with RCTs, and um, I, I myself is somebody who believes a lot, in, not believes, but I do follow, I do uh, believe in some ways that RCTs can be very useful. I'm wondering whether the problem is, because we have been a long time very focused on intervention and drugs. So the scientific community was driven, associated to it, with RCTs, because that's how to do it. And there is a fear, if we would, for other reasons, 
leave the RCTs, the drugs would follow it and leave the RCT and cause other problems. So if the scientific community wanted to follow up with the idea of empathy, what would be the way to go? That would be my general question. Well, we've got two, we'll have two responses, I think. Well, I'll, I'll start with you, Rupert. Oh, no, go forward. You go first. Go forward. Go forward. Go forward. <laughs> Uh, I'm very distressed to hear that somebody believes in RCTs here. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, 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 interesting actually to hear two GPs saying all this evidence-based nonsense. That's extremely interesting because the whole of our profession is having to kowtow to this evidence-based uh, movement. And we've got two GPs here saying it's nonsense. Of course it's not all nonsense. Some of it's very powerful, and, and my point is that for acute interventions, it's a fantastic methodology, and it's a very good methodology for a simple drug intervention, as you say. It's just completely the wrong methodology for many other things. So you ask what methodology we should use. Well, I think we have to have a fairly big paradigm shift of methodologies, and we have to get away from positivism and reductionism and actually move to something like the realist research uh, approach which says that there is a sort of truth out there, but it's contingent and it's context dependent, and to start trying to unravel mechanisms through a realist approach. So that would be the way I'd go. Yes, I mean, evidence-based medicine is based around the, that kind of science. It gives you the answers you want to. If you do a randomized control trial, you get an answer about that. When you're trying to measure things like empathy, you need entirely different um, mechanisms, and psychology labs will do that. Uh, qualitative research will do that. And to a certain extent, real-life um, data. So where you take large amounts of um, people who've been through a particular intervention, has that affected outcomes? And you take large numbers of people, and you can then sometimes see effects from that. Um, but it is much more difficult to measure in an objective way. Can I just add something? I think a very useful distinction is between efficacy and effect effectiveness. These are two technical words. Efficacy refers to the specific effect of the drug. So when Paul was putting up those uh, diagrams of the placebo effect and the drug effect and the little bit extra which the drug has, that's the efficacy. Now, effectiveness is everything. The placebo effect, the drug effect, and also, of course, whether the patient takes the drug, which, of course, is a, a, large, uh, effect, a large determinant. So if we look at effectiveness, which is essentially looking at what happens in real clinical practice, then I think if we measure outcomes carefully, uh, and of course there's a debate about which particular outcomes we measure. But nevertheless, if we look at clinical practice rather than clinical trials, then perhaps we will get a better understanding of what is effective treatment. Because at the end of the day, the patient isn't interested in the efficacy of the treatment, but the effectiveness. I've heard patients say, you know, I don't mind why it works, I don't mind if it's a placebo, as long as it works. And I think effectiveness is really what we ought to be focusing on rather than efficacy. A question at the front. Sorry, I shouldn't have spoken so long. Um, just um, a quick comment and then a question, really. Um, and the comment is, as a sociologist, I'm very interested in the kind of culture of medicine. And you sort of alluded to the culture is a bit problematic. And the problem is the culture. And actually, we need perhaps a little bit more focus on the on the cultural aspects of medicine and what's happening in, within the culture. And uh, Roger here next to me is doing, um, finish, almost finished his PhD, where he's been studying GPs and the culture of GPs. So perhaps we can have a word with you afterwards. But um, work I've been doing in, uh, recently, and it's really got me quite motivated, is um, to do with what um, I and a colleague talked about as the emotional labor that doctors do as part of their work. So they, and that might be another way to approach the concept of empathy. So that um, doctors' work isn't, is, is, they do heavy emotional work, and it's not often recognized or taught or thought about in those terms. And when you start talking to doctors about the emotional work they do, they see it immediately, as do other people recognize it. But um, they have, there is a problem, I'm sure you're aware of this, with um, burnout, depression. I mean, all healthcare workers suffer from it, 
but um, dogs have particular kinds of problems. Um, uh, well, al- there's increased um, level of alcoholism, for example. And, you know, they're all working the culture, and you've just kind of hinted at it, um, is increasingly a difficult one. You know, it's a much more fractured experience. Um, there is a, quite a lot of considerable amount of burnout. And um, I think that we also need to think about caring for doctors, as the BMA has started to do now with Doctors for Doctors. So I'm, I'm, I guess my question is, do you, do you think that the emotional work that doctors do is something that's recognised or and needs to be thought of? Um, and the question's... Uh, um, thank you for it. I think that's a great question. Um, there's no doubt emotional burnout happens in general practice. I think it is partly because you're dealing with deeply emotional problems. I mean, I have today it's a series of four or five different people who come to me with hugely important emotional issues. And I have 15 minutes. So one of these patients takes 20 minutes or half an hour. And then I'm already late for the next one, and you've just got the baggage from the last consultation still at the back of your mind, and you're still emotionally in the, the last one, when the next patient comes in, you've got to focus that, and then the phone goes, and someone else... You know, it's actually really difficult to do that. Um, and how do you learn how to cope with that? I think the training of GPs does address this very well in some areas, and in some areas not very well at all. I've recently been trying to support a training doctor who's been supported not at all uh, in this. And I think it's really patchy, and I think it needs to be done a lot better across the patch. Um, and I think the other things about these organizational factors that these, well, I think are irrelevant to care, all the tick boxing exercises create a huge problem for my practice manager coming to me all the time saying, this, 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 and this. Um, and that puts an immense pressure on us. So I think it's a big issue we need to address. Great question. Two quick comments, Una. One is that um, I think there has been a macho culture in medicine. Doctors look after other people that don't get sick themselves, and that's very damaging. Uh, And the other comment would be that I think when we talk about compassion, you need to start with compassion for yourself. If you don't look after yourself and are not compassionate to yourself, you can't be effectively compassionate to others. And that's a lesson that my God, our profession needs to learn. Um, just, just a quick finished comment on that is that um, um, at the moment I'm doing some training um, and counselling, and one of the things we learn is that we have to process and work, we have to have be supported to be counselled. But doctors, who in many respects are having to give constantly, are not necessarily supported, or actually rarely. Thank you, that, that very, very helpful and useful we've point. One, one we've got quick question. One time for one more question. We've got a question... Ben, uh, Rebe- ben because he hasn't had it got a go yet. Very quick one, very quick. You, you joke that you'd like to give a tonic, or that you, you, know, you wish you could give a tonic, so do you really mean it? And if, if, you, if you do, what else do you think we should use from our knowledge of placebo and, and the basic knowledge we have now? What should we actually be doing? I, I think really what I was expressing is a sadness um, the, the time when an old lady could come to me and say, I just want a tonic doctor, and I could give it in good faith, has passed. And I think those days aren't going to come back. Um, so what do we do instead of giving a tonic? Um, we get uh, someone to do some talking therapy instead. I hope we don't give them something toxic, like an antidepressant, um, as a substitute uh, for being nice to them. Well, <laughs> don't get me started on homeopathy. <laughs> No, I don't get either of us started on homeopathy. How, how dare the medical profession diss homeopathy when it's got no idea whether it works or whether it doesn't? Uh, so anyway, I've had a little rant there. I think it's a huge question that you've raised about giving of placebos and the use of placebos. I think the important thing is, personally, that whatever we give, we do it in the right spirit of love and caring and with enthusiasm about the likelihood that it's going to work. Well, on that note, I think it's just up to me to thank our two speakers for a really excellent evening. I think it's been a shocking evening. I think it's been an informative evening. And I think we all will go away a lot more sober 
and perhaps a little bit more caring as a result. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank you for your comments. Thank you to our speakers. And thank you for your